want to thank everyone for coming out. I know people uh, are busy, and I especially want to welcome the students. I am in the, uh, practice in Columbus at Columbia St. Mary's, which is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we have residents in the OBGYN program and the family medicine program rotate to our hospital, as well as the medical students. And half a day a week, one of the medical students goes each medical student goes to someone's office, so I, I have a special heart for medical students, and I just want to encourage you. So, um, Father Blazik assigned my topic, so non-pharmacologic, holistic, and alternative therapy and fertility in women's health. I am on the advisory board for the Marquette model of natural family planning. The um, Institute for Natural Family Planning at Marquette was started um, back in the late 90s, and I have been in Milwaukee uh, for 18 years. And Dr. Faring is probably one of the most prolific and brilliant people I've ever met in my life. And he knows much more about natural family planning than I do, even as an OBGYN. So he um, shared with me some of his slides, and I appreciate that. And some of you may have read a lot of his work in the Lineker Quarterly, which is put out by the Catholic Medical Association, and I would say he is the single one person that can be on both sides, the contraceptive people and talk their language, and he knows all the methods, and he's very open, and he keeps you up to date with that current medical research. So uh, this is a picture of my compadres. Um, I have lots of experience with natural family planning. I went through the Creighton model medical consulting program way back in 1997 and I have been at Marquette with them ever since they started developing their model and I am the contact person for my parish in Milwaukee. We have a sister parish in Chiapas, Mexico. So I've been there teaching the standard days method and the two-day method and um, these are indigenous Indians that live in a town of Tenihapa and that's their traditional dress. And Juan Giron is my compadre, he's a permanent deacon, and his wife Lucia, um, God rest her soul, she passed away since this picture. Um, it was an amazing experience teaching natural family planning, and this is where people really get what natural family planning is all about. So my objectives are gonna to be to discuss how natural family planning works, and the historical development. I know we have a really wide variety of experience. So some of you may be um, learning about natural family planning for the very first time, and it's gonna be sort of a whirlwind look at it, and some of you are very well versed in one or more of the methods. Um, so hopefully you can learn something about the other methods. And the one thing that um, Father Blazik told me is he wanted to talk about effectiveness. I think that's been one of our uh, biggest criticisms, and it's a little bit of a fallacy. So I'm going to present some of the scientific studies. It's not a comprehensive review of the scientific studies, but I just tried to pick out one study with each method that shows how the effectiveness was determined. So for the academic types, um, we'll get a little bit more deeper into how that effectiveness was determined. And then in the end, I just want to discuss some of the challenges that we face um, with natural family planning and getting people to accept it and adopt it and uh, suggest some of the directions we can go in the future. So the very, very basic nuts and bolts of natural family planning are that men are always fertile, 100% of the time. And women are only fertile for a very short portion of each of their cycles. So the rate limiting step is the woman. So the basics of natural family planning, if you don't want to get pregnant, then you don't have sex on the fertile days. And if you want to get pregnant, you have sex on the fertile days. So what we learn to do in natural family planning, as most of you know, is monitor and interpret natural biologic markers of fertility. So these natural biologic markers of fertility will define that fertile time and the infertile time for us. And then we can use that information and decide whether 
um, a couple months to try to avoid a pregnancy at the time or achieve a pregnancy. So this is where the non-pharmacological part comes in. Obviously, um, Dr. Lawler explained to us all of the side effects, all of the long-term effects of being on hormonal contraception. So natural family planning is wonderful in that it's safe and there are no side effects. It's holistic. So people who use the natural family planning, they think of fertility as a gift, not a disease. So we work with the fertility and the beautiful gift that God has given us. It's not dependent on just one partner in the couple. It's a shared method. So it's holistic to the relationship of the couple. It fits with moral, ethical, and spiritual beliefs of every religion. People use natural family planning who are all religions. They use it overseas. Um, one of our natural family planning teachers of the Marquette model in Milwaukee is a Buddhist who's a nurse on a mom baby. So her mom taught her from when she was growing up that hormonal contraception would be bad. Um, and it's also holistic because there's none of the other forms of family planning can be both used to achieve and avoid. I always say when people go to Planned Parenthood, are they planning to be parents? Or are they planning not to be parents? <laughs> so we have a different advantage that way. And the therapeutic part of natural family planning um, is really that the menstrual cycle and understanding fertility can help us understand what different problems women are having with their cycles. I can't tell you how wonderful it is when a patient who uses NFP comes to see me and she's having a problem with bleeding because she has it all just laid out there. I can see if she's ovulating, I can see what her mucus is. It gives us a ton of information. And the natural technology really is the therapeutic part of natural family planning, where we can identify those problems, particularly infertility, and we can work to resolve those problems using natural family planning. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history. Natural family planning started in the 1920s. Uh, Ogino in Japan figured out by observing eggs that ovulation preceded the menstrual cycle by about 14 days. And he speculated, and it turned out to be true, that the egg would live between 12 and 24 hours, and that the sperm would live three to five days. So he was one of the first to develop the original calendar method of natural family planning. Then in the 1930s, um, Dr. Lotz, he's the one who coined the term rhythm, and he actually was an OBGYN at Loyola. So the rhythm method started here. So we can all channel that through lots. And uh, what he figured out was that if you took the shortest cycle, minus 19 days, and you marked the start of the fertile window as being the following day, then you would subtract your shortest cycle from your longest cycle, add eight more days, and that would be your fertile window. So if a woman had regular cycles, and her shortest cycle was 26 days, and her longest cycle in the last six months was 30 days, then her fertile window would be between days 8 and 19. So this was kind of prophetic. And we'll uh, look ahead when we see the standard days method that, uh, with the little information they had, Dr. Latz and Dr. Obano actually came almost uh, 80 years ago up with the basis of the natural family. So most people think about natural family planning as a rhythm method. But actually, the modern methods of natural family planning, which can be used by all women, whether or not they have regular cycles, were developed in the 50s and the 60s. So anyone that thinks natural family planning is the rhythm method is about 50 to 60 years behind the times. And it just happened that that was about the time when the birth control pill and all of those things were being developed and it sort of was uh, not uh, accepted in general as people were hoping that the Catholic Church would approve the birth control pill. Um, all this was going on at the same time. So Retzer and Keith were the ones that developed and identified the basal body temperature shift and that's the basis for the symptothermal methods. Uh, the billing started developing their method based on the cervical mucus sign, and then in the following couple decades, 
Um, most of the methods were developed, the crate model, um, the couple to couple lead, and those were disseminated. So now in the 1990s, the things that uh, came along was the idea of the NAPRO technology. And that was developed by Dr. Hilders at the Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha based on the Creighton model. And also in the 1990s, the, um, the, what we call the low tech. Um, this was developed at Georgetown and they had two different methods that they um, developed and researched uh, mostly in the developing world, the cycle beads and the two-day mucus method. Uh, this is when I was in Chiapas giving our last one, I guess this would be low tech, you can, I don't know if any of you read that, it's mini super pharmacia la central. So uh, if uh, you needed birth control pills and you lived in Chiapas, this would be your pharmacy. And unfortunately, that's what the indigenous people tell us, the government sponsored clinics have medical students that just show up every once in a while. And the only medications ever available are birth control pills. So it kind of gives you the insight into what um, has been happening in sort of pushing this contraceptive agenda, not just here in the U.S., but overseas. So they were very happy to have us come because they knew that their wives were miserable more than they were on the pill. And they're also being um, coerced into sterilization and often having IUDs put in when they didn't even know it. So uh, the new millennium is high-tech natural family planning, which is the Marquette model. Um, Dr. Faring used the clear blue fertility monitor to actually measure the hormones directly. So instead of monitoring the signs in your body of the hormones and the changes that the hormones make, actually measure the hormones directly in the urine. So now that we have the technology, go right to the fact. So what are the biological markers we use in natural family planning? Obviously the menstrual cycle. It's the starting point for every single method. The cervical mucus that Dr. Lawler talked about. The temperature, and then we can also measure the hormones directly. So this slide um, will be familiar to the medical students and the practitioners in the room. And I just want you to focus on a couple things. At the top, that peak on the green where it says LH, that's the hormone that is released right before ovulation. And that's the one that you measure when you do the ovulation predictor test. And that's one of the hormones that's measured with a clear blue fertility monitor. Next, if you see the light blue, little hump in the middle, that's the estrogen. So we talked about the follicle produces estrogen, which makes the mucus good. And that peaks right there before ovulation. And then the next line down, um, the progesterone, you see that the progesterone goes up after ovulation. So it's the progesterone that makes the temperature go up and also makes mucus dry up. So just to review, this is like the most important thing. If everyone just remembers these things, if you're new to natural family planning, estrogen is what promotes the mucus, LH is what triggers the ovulation and like, the peak type mucus and then the corpus luteum produces progesterone after ovulation, dries out the mucus, and causes your temperature to rise. Here's another little uh, diagram of that. You can see on the top, the egg is developing and the, at ovulation it's released. The second line down is the basal body temperature chart. So the central thermal method, people chart their temperatures. You can see that. The next one, you see a picture of a uterus with the cervix, and these are all sort of lined up temporally, and you can see that right around ovulation, you get that wet, stretchy, slippery mucus. And then afterwards, it gets thick and dries up. I actually learned about natural family planning when I was a medical student from one of my friends who was married, and she was using natural family planning, and I said, well, what is that? <laughs> and um, she said, well, what you do is you check your mucus. And I said, what? And it just seems so weird to me as a medical student. I had never even heard of this. I was only in my first year. Um, and I, they didn't teach us in the all of medical school either. But the idea of the mucus is you can 
They either check it on the toilet paper, which is what uh, the crate model um, teaches you how to check multiple times during the day, and then you put it between your fingers and you can check the mucus. Uh, the Billings method, they also use the idea of just sensation. So you're not even really checking anything with your fingers. You're just sort of um, intuitively thinking about how the sensation feels in the vulvar area for the woman. This is the clear blue fertility monitor. Um, the Persona is a similar monitor that they were using in Europe. Same principles. So with the clear blue fertility monitor, um, one bar is low fertility. Two bars is when the estrogen metabolite starts being produced. So the fertility monitor measures both estrogen and the LH. So when people use the Marquette model, when they start to get that second bar, then they know their fertility is, um, the fertility window is starting. And then the peak fertility, um, you get three lines and you get the little egg. And my patients who are trying to get pregnant, one of them, she was so excited, she said, I got the egg, I got the egg. So, so the second thing I want you to really remember about natural planning, planning is there's a six day window of fertility. This is what we're after, okay? The sperm will live in the cervical mucus for up to five days. The egg will live for 12 to 24 hours. So if we can just figure out what those six days are, that's the whole goal of the natural family planning. So there's a study, a famous study in the New England Journal, and I have it in my references for you. They took 221 women who were trying to get pregnant, and they were measuring their urine hormones and they used that to estimate their day of ovulation. And they had them only have intercourse once per cycle. And then they calculated, based on the hormones, what was the probability each day related to ovulation that they would get pregnant. So they, they confirmed this six-day window that we know about. I'm sorry that these numbers aren't very big, but what they found was five days out there was less than a 10% chance of conceiving on that day. So I've had a few patients who conceived on um, five days before ovulation, who have the super sperm, I call them. <laughs> um, then, for whatever reason, the fourth day before, 17%, the third day before, 8%. But really, the maximum fertility is the, day bef the two days before, and the day of ovulation. So in couples of normal fertility, having sex on those best days, there's about a 35% chance of getting pregnant. So for people who are trying to get pregnant, if they don't get pregnant on the first try, I always say even in the best conditions, it's only about 35%. So how do we figure out when the beginning of that window is? We notice a change in the vaginal secretions and the mucus method. If you're doing the Marquette model, you're checking your urine and you're measuring for that estrogen and you're getting that second bar. Also, with the symptothermal method, use part of that calendar calculation. So sometimes with that calendar calculation, the fertile window would actually start before you get that first mucus. And then how do we know that the fertile phase is over? You get the change in the vaginal secretion, your temperature goes up, or you have the monitor shows you that you did ovulate and you know that the egg's only gonna live for 12 to 24 hours. So we have the beginning and we have the end. But we can't precisely make it those six days. This is a little bit of a model of how not every woman has her period on the 28th day, or 28 day cycles, okay? A lot of my patients think there's something wrong with them if their period doesn't come exactly on the same day every month. And I just say that's normal. So on this graph you see the red is when you would be getting your period, the green would be a time of infertility, and then there's that six day fertile window. So. If you had a 29-day cycle, like the top one, 
then the fertile window would be shifted. But if you had a shorter cycle, your fertile window might start just as your period's ending. And if you had a long cycle, the fertile window could be shifted all the way over to the right. Because we know that the time from ovulation to your next cycle is pretty much constant. So this is the modern method of natural family planning. This is where we can help women who don't have regular cycles. We're not using calendar calculations. We're using hormonal markers to identify this fertile window. And we'll know wherever it is. It doesn't have to be at the same time every month. So these are just the generalized different methods. I'm going to explain a little bit more detail about each method and then talk about one of the studies, the scientific studies that shows its efficacy. So we have the mucus-based method, which would be the Billings, the Creighton model, and then the two-day method, which they developed at Georgetown. We have the symptothermal, which here in the U.S. would be couple to couple also in Northwest Services. Symptohormonal, that would be the Marquette model. The standard days really goes back to the calendar rhythm. Um, and that's actually more effective than you would expect. So we're going to talk about that. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is lactation amenorrhea and breastfeeding, because that's one of the most challenging aspects of natural family planning is the woman who's postpartum breastfeeding. Okay. So efficacy. This is what the standard scientific medical world thinks about efficacy. So perfect or correct use. That would be the number of unintended pregnancies that occur when the method is used consistently and according to instructions. Typical use is the pregnancy rate when the methods are followed correctly and the unintended pregnancies together that occur when the users of the method don't always follow the instructions. So that's typical use. Okay? So the difference between what the correct use and the incorrect use is often how hard it is to use the method or how much of a human factor there is in using the method. So let's start with the billings. So the Billings model that they developed way back in the 50s and 60s, fertile period begins with the onset of the mucus, peak day is when you see the last day of that really stretchy mucus, you can stretch it on your finger. You're instructed to avoid having sex when you're on your cycle, do every other day during those dry days before ovulation, and then wait until the fourth day in the evening after the peak day. So you learn your method, you monitor your fertility, you decide if you're trying to avoid pregnancy or try to get pregnant, and then you have it all mapped out of what days are fertile enough. This is one study um, published in 1996 from India. So over 2,000 women, and they did it for a really long time, 21 months, correct use 1%. Typical use at 12 months, which is what they usually do, 10.5%. So Dr. Lawler said that they say it's 24%. It's not 24%. Typical use is 10.5%. When you extended it out, 15.9%. But obviously, people are going to decide at some point that they probably want to have another baby. So they might change their intention. The Creighton model is based on the Billings model but it was standardized. The teachers are trained amazingly. It's very rigorous. They have a standardized system for the um, vaginal discharge. It's taught in multiple sessions with the couples with lots of support. And because it's so standardized, it allowed Dr. Hilgers to sort of look at the whole picture of all the clients and have all those charts and start making correlations of what was happening with people health-wise and their fertility based on what their mucus observations were. So the interesting thing about the Cranium model is they don't publish typical use. And that's been a criticism 
um, from the people who don't understand how we NFP people think, why would you publish typical use? Because Dr. Hildreth believes if you have the information <coughs> set out for you, and you know that you have a fertile day, and you decide that you're going to have it, of course, anyways, well, then you changed. You're not really using the method anymore to avoid having pregnancy. You're using it to achieve a pregnancy. So one of the studies using the crate model done by um, Margaret Howard and Dr. Stanford, who's at uh, out in Utah, they did an uh, observational cohort, 700 clients, 18 months. If they used it correctly, 3%. But the typical use was 17%. So if they just took all the clients that got pregnant, which is how they do the other family clients, say 17%. So say someone's using condoms and one day they decide, oh, we're not going to use condoms, or I forgot to take my pill. They would be lumped into typical use. So our typical use is 17% because maybe some people are more open to becoming pregnant or decide they try to get pregnant. Most of the pregnancies that resulted were either using a fertile day or changing your mind. So the idea of NAPRA technology is that it's cooperative and restorative. So we cooperate with your body and we restore normality. Whether that is hormonal, improving mucus, improving the progesterone levels, fixing endometriosis. It's not, it's totally different than artificial reproductive technology and in vitro fertilization. And the, the cornerstone of doing APRO is charting with the Crick model. So I don't do a lot of APRO technology, but I have a lot of patients who use Crick model and work with Dr. Hilger's um, long distance, and so then I order whatever tests and whatever things he recommends. And he has an amazing success rate. And the endometriosis surgery is the cornerstone too. So the two-day method is something that they developed at Georgetown, which is a little different than how we would think of the six-day fertile window. What they did is they looked at charts, looked at when there was mucus and what was the likelihood of ovulation, and they put it into a big program, and they figured out this idea that if you could just remember one day to the next. <coughs> Did you have mucus today? Did you have mucus yesterday? If either is yes, then it would be a fertile day. And if both are no, then it would be an infertile day. This is a method, one of the methods we were teaching in Chiapas. And it's really helpful because it's fast to teach. And especially people who work and live on the land of the agriculture, the idea of mucus and fertility and wet and dry is really resonant with them. So um, their efficacy study, which was published, showed correct use 3.5%, typical use 13.7. Again, that's not 24. 13.7 excellent studies published, mainstream journals, 13%. This is my teacher training. <laughs> Oh, this is like a little break when we're having coffee. Um, and a few people out there, what's so unusual about this? All men. All men. <laughs> this is the teacher training of all men teachers. <laughs> the reason was that um, in our sister parish, there's 70 indigenous communities served by two priests. And each community has one person that's elected to be the health person for their community. And so these guys are the health people. So when we said, okay, we'll come down and teach national family planning, and the indigenous <laughs> people got the people ready to learn about it, these are the ones that go to learn about um, public health and all those other things, and they're gonna be the national family planning teachers. Um, so it's very fun to talk to them about mucus. Plus, <laughs> I speak Spanish, and um, most of the men have speak some Spanish, but they speak an Ayodhya Sal Salpal. So Manuel, who's the guy second from the left, he's kind of like, I think he would have been a physician if he had the opportunity. He's kind of the 
midwife, they you know, run this little clinic. So he would translate for me from Spanish into self-help. If you notice that guy in the middle in the back, he's a big man. <laughs> I'm from Minnesota originally, so I had to laugh when I saw it. My brothers have season tickets, so I texted them. Breaking fans in Chiapas. Okay, simple thermal method, start of the fertile window identified by the mucus sign, and temperature goes up. A double check, a lot of the European studies use a double check where they put in the calendar rhythm to give that extra um, sort of coverage before ovulation. So there was a multi-center study, 1999. The single check was just mucus and temperature. Typical use was 8.5%. The double check, okay, did um, Dr. Trussell mention this in his 24%. 2.6% typical use, not even correct use. That's better than the pill. Symptom hormonal, we talked a little bit about that. So you use the monitor and the mucus. Um, sorry that this is a little bit small, but Dr. Perry developed his own sort of mucus system. And you see as the X's go up, that's where the mucus is. And then the blue is where you're doing the <laughs> monitoring. Um, so what he did is, um, when we first started developing the Marquette model, there were some people that were using just mucus. The monitor obviously is expensive. That's one of the very big downsides of the Marquette model is that you have to buy a monitor, which is about $150, and you have to buy the sticks. So what they did is they compared the people who were using the monitor and the mucus and the people who were using just the mucus. And what they found was the correct use was the same. But the typical use for the monitor um, there was a 12.5% pregnancy rate and for the mucus was a little bit higher. That was in the 20s. So what they found when they went back and looked at the fertile window, the monitor, six days. That monitor gives you the six days. The mucus, um, sort of the fertile window was on average 11 days. So what Dr. Ferry did, and I think this was also uh, first, he got an HSS grant and he did a randomized control trial. That's what they say the gold standard is. And what he did is he had people randomized to either learn just the mucus method in an online program or learn the Marquette model. Um, so they had uh, over a thousand cycles, correct use, 3,000 cycles total. So the perfect use in the Marquette model was zero, and for the mucus group it was 3%. And you can see here, correct use, and then typical use. So 7% typical use in that study. And for the mucus it was 19%. So his mucus method is not the billings and it's not the freight. So you might say, well maybe the mucus is something that you can't just put on money. Maybe you need a little bit more guidance from someone in person. The standard days is the cycle beads. I, don't know, I forgot to bring my cycle beads. It's a necklace. Um, you start a red bead, then there's some brown beads. You can use it if your cycles are between 26 and 32 days. It has a little rubber ring that the woman advances along each one. The white beads are the fertile days and the beads glow in the dark. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> so if you live somewhere where you don't have electricity, it wouldn't matter. You know, you know. Really. And then that also is very easy to teach. And the interesting thing, you can buy it at Whole Foods. So, so it's, it's hip too. I haven't seen anyone wearing cycle beads around. But. The standard days, they did develop the formula. Like we said lots, right? He had that eight to 19 days just by what he presumed that the, they used 7,500 cycles, computer simulation, and they came up with the eight to 19. So that's 12 days of abstinence. That's a lot, a lot of abstinence, but it covers the, all the possible days of fertility. And what they found, 5% correct use, 12% typical. So if you live in a developing world where you have nothing, 12% is really good. Um, 
Could it be better? Okay, here I was in Chiapas. The, that was the, the woman in the purple, our only uh, female teacher. <laughs> she was at both sessions. She's a single female, and so uh, was Dr. Jones Mozachek was with us, and we were given our own typical dress, and they laughed at us the whole time. We walked around so proud in our little indigenous outfits, and all of the people were just laughing. <laughs> Look at those people in their outfits. Okay, breastfeeding. Women don't get sleep, they can't rely on their temperature. A lot of people have mucus all the time. You can ovulate before you get your period, and most people are trying to avoid. So the lactation amenorrhea also um, developed out of Georgetown. If you're fully breastfeeding for the first six months, you haven't gotten your period, there's only a 2% chance of getting pregnant. So fully breastfeeding is breastfeeding all the time. So a lot of women in the States because they have to go back to work or whatever, they're not fully breastfeeding. But if that's your situation, you can just take those first six months and your fertility will be low. So at Marquette, they developed what's called a breastfeeding protocol using the monitor to try to help um, the situation. What you do is you're testing your urine every other day, looking for the second bar, and then test every day. What they found was um, two unintended pregnancies. But people who are breastfeeding have lower fertility in any way. Okie doke. So we talked about what helps for making NFP effective. You have to be motivated. You have to be able to communicate with your partner. And I want to say, all the methods, every single one, has similar correct use effectiveness. So whether you're learning Symptothermal, Creighton, Billings, Marquette, two days, standard days, if you're motivated, you will be successful. And it just depends where you live, what's available, um, or if you want to go online. So here is the slide that Dr. Lawler had shown you. Um, so the withdrawal 27, the pill, typical use 8. So we're definitely better than the pill for correct use, especially in the symptothermal. So is that we tend to focus on our correct use because we know why our people using natural family planning are having more babies because maybe they decide to use a day of fertility. Where our critics are sort of saying, we go on the typical use and we see that NFP users have probably about 15% typical use. So how can we help that? This is a little graph by Dr. Faring. He, when he did his randomized controlled trial, showed um, measured motivation, asked the patients to, or the clients to say, and um, if they were not motivated, there were 75% uh, chance of getting pregnant. So we talked about why there's the bias in the literature, and the reason why they came up with the 24 number was they based it on a survey of 7,000 people, just asked them what they were using for family planning and did they get pregnant. They didn't ask them, are you using just whatever days you made up in your head? Are you using a modern method of natural family planning? It was probably about 50 NFP users. So they use that as sort of the standard, which is not even from authoritative data. So few women use NFP, 2% um, of Catholics, very few physicians know about NFP. Some of them even are hostile. My patients tell me they've been to doctors and yelled at them for using NFP. So I have a really nice group of NFP users for my patients, along with people who don't. Most of it is ignorance, the perception it doesn't work. Most people who use NFP that have big families say they find every one of them. Um, people think that abstinence would be difficult. I think we would disagree. Some of the methods take more learning, more practice, and it kind of goes against our sexual revolution. So I think in order to educate and evangelize, we need grassroots. We need NFP users to talk to their friends. We need to get young women thinking about their fertility. We need faith formation. We do a uh, presentation at the um, newly the engaged couples in the Diocese of Milwaukee. 
And unfortunately, most of the people are already contracepting and already having sex. The students at MCW are asking to get the natural family planning in their curriculum. At Georgetown, they have a whole elective on natural family planning. So the students can push to try to get that available. And for the physicians, I think you're not going to convince an OBGYN unless you're another OBGYN. And what they really want is science. They want randomized control trials. I'm out of time. <laughs> I only have a couple more slides. So I think we all have to collaborate. Um, everyone is their own little method. They kind of get in their own little world. They don't think about it. There's the Facts for Chile Awareness Collaborative. They put out a new um, paper. I have the reference there. And I think we have to improve the methods. They have to be easier for people to learn, less confusing, less time. Um, the Jafari is developing an app on a smartphone. There's some, some other um, internet-based things for fertility charting, too. And I think we, the more we can limit the absence time, the better they'll be acceptable. So there's the bibliography. I brought some printed handouts, and I think this is also going to be available online. Mm -hmm. And that's Chip. The guys wear their ribbon hats. And this is, um, I was there for the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, teaching NFP, and you can see their sun is setting, looking up in the mountains, in their traditional books. Thank you, Dr. Mickelson. Responding to Dr. Mickelson is uh, Dr. Rebecca Davis of Matthias, who's an ethicist for kindred health and also a professor and colleague at Dominican University. Uh, Dr. Davis Matthias. challenges that we all face in our faith formation. So in the short time I have with you this morning, we'll go over some of the church teachings in cyclicals that help support all of the focus on natural family planning and positive outcomes on women's health. So I'll go through this very quickly. By the way, my slides will be available um, through the Integrity Health Institute afterwards. You'll notice here that all we have to recognize that the infertility challenges all automatically bring about these great burdens for us for couples to bear, especially when they so deeply desire a child to live out their vocation, to be open to life and welcome the gift of children from God. Infertility treatment must respect God's design for married love. So we've been talking about natural family planning, we have Dr. Lawler talking about hormonal contraception. We're going to take a look at a slightly different angle for infertility and how to get pregnant. In other words, we've seen ways of avoiding pregnancy, and the church is all about how to inform us about how to get pregnant. The church with sincere compassion and empathy offers guidance and hope through their teachings. And basically through the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. There are all kinds of references that you can access there, even when you just Google infertility and U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. We see here that, that actually infertility challenges, and we, the church recommends you know, how to understand and approach infertility in a way that references and protects the dignity of the human person and respects God's divine plan for married love. The challenge, of course, is to diagnose and address problems so these bodies can function as they should, as they're meant and designed to be. And there's no moral problem in doing this any more than there is any, any other medical treatments to restore health. And this is from the document from 2009, Life Giving Love in the Age of Technology. It's all based on the natural law. How many of you have heard of the natural law in the Catholic teaching? Very good. Okay, I'll go over a very brief summit, summary of it. It's the moral teachings, the lex naturalis, it's understood the light of the revelation of Christ, and has entrusted to his church. It's a law that is written on the human heart. It's recognized by reason. It's a law distinct from any positive law of the state. We see from the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services, even, we have, from this source the church has derived its understanding of the nature of the human person, human acts, the goals that shape human activity. This is from the directives number 38. When the marital act of sexual intercourse is not able to attain its procreative purpose, the assistance that does not separate the unitive and the procreative ends of the act 
and does not substitute for the marital act itself may be used to help married couples conceive. So there's a great deal of support in using this type of macro technology or other technologies to help people conceive, women conceive. In 39, we see those techniques of assisted conception that respect the unitive and procreative beings of sexual intercourse and do not involve the destruction of human embryos or their delivered direct generation in such numbers that it is clearly envisioned that all cannot implant and some are simply being used to maximize the chances of others implanting may be used as therapies for fertility. I'm sorry, for intro children. Then in 40, we find here there are heterocatalogous uh, criminalization concepts here that, that the church comments as well as homologous. This is in 41. I'll go straight to because of our time today. Um, in 43, we see a Catholic healthcare institution that provides treatment for infertility should not only offer technical assistance to intro couples, but also the counseling that they actually need. And there's a, there's a, there's a holistic sense of the human person. So it's looking at not only the technical aspects and the medical condition, but then spiritually as well. There are three moral considerations for us to consider. There is a moral order, and we know that through church teachings. This moral order can be known. What it means to be human is the basis of this moral order. So again, this is open to all faiths, all credences, all philosophies, because it's a human universal law, and also therefore a divine law. There are three funds of morality, the act itself, the intention behind the act, and then of course the circumstances or the consequences of the act. In any type of infertility types of challenges, all of these come into play. What's the motivation behind you, behind this couple, wanting to get pregnant? Is it a quantification of the child perspective, that they want to actually have it so that their social status rises? Obviously it's not for economic reasons, um, but perhaps for social reasons, but what is the motivation behind wanting and loving child. A moral compass is being calculated. So very quickly, we can just see as I bring these up very quickly here, the types of questions that are being asked. In Humanae Vitae, we find that this was in 1968. This is Pope, John, Pope Paul VI, uh, July 25th, 1968, promulgation. It's the magisterial teaching of the church. We've had references to that in our other presentations. Um, as this is on the regulation of birth. Why is this document so important? The issue of united controversy, of course, because it said that basically that because you are a church uh, member, that, that you are believing a Christian, that you should follow church teaching. There was a huge amount of controversy because there were so many other theologians and regular lay people who said it seems impossible to follow such church teaching. So basically, we find that many people reverted to conscience as their arbiter. Prior to Vatican II, of course, this came out, uh, the dead deliberations were occurring, and the common Catholic theologians raised all these questions, as I talked about. Pope John XXIII appointed a commission to study the subject. It started with just six men, mostly scientists. It grew to over 60 members, including four women. It was dialogue, very dialogical for three years. Then, at the end of the commission's third meeting in 1964, Pope Paul VI urged the group to continue its deliberations, listen to the anxiety of so many souls, and work diligently without worrying about criticism or difficulties. The, prophecy, the prophecies that contraception would lead to, he prophesied this because, and as we see in our previous talks, that we, we see the consequences of having access to artificial contraception. And these are, listen, as I pulse through this. So there's been a, a dissemination of all kinds of promotion of the pill, as we recognize in our, our sexual revolutionary culture. And this seems antithetical to that. And yet when you read the document, you find that it is so rich in upholding the spiritual value of all people, from the moment of conception through natural death. And all the encyclicals actually ground themselves in that premise. In Humanity Vitae number seven, the question of human appropriation cannot be limited to mere scientific analysis. We've seen a lot of science being, being actually exposed here this morning. And we have to take a look at the other side. There are many other sides of the human person. It's not just about the science. It's about the spiritual, the emotional, the intellectual portion of the human being as well. Caritas and Veritate with 2009, Pope Benedict XVI, the Church, he says, demonstrates a commitment to monitor and critique due respect for human dignity and human flourishing as technology progresses. For example, 
He says he advocates that the church's mission is primarily a moral and evangelical one and not a technical one of medicine or economics. Then, that's of Pope John Paul II, who's a great defender of humana vitae. He said it provides a personalist understanding of sexuality. He's a great proponent of this personalist sense of sexuality, especially in the theology of the body. How many of you have actually read or seen the theology of the body? Good, that's a good, good amount, great. And then you recognize what a great contribution that is to our understanding, as well as familiar as consortium. It promotes natural family planning, of course, in those documents. Fertility is often is offered to one's partner, and notice how <coughs> you see it and lovingly received. So it's an offer of the self of one person to another and graciously, lovingly received. It's fully human. It allows for the transcendence of desire through self-control in the service of a higher good. Fully giving and open to the acceptance of children. We notice here that Blessed John Paul II claims that science and faith are not foreign to one another, but on the contrary, both need to reciprocally complement each other. He says, we are now touching upon the autonomy of the sciences. Today, the postulate of unlimited freedom in scientific research is often defended. In this regard, if on one hand, it is necessary to recognize the right of the sciences to apply the methods of research that are proper to them, we are now touching upon the autonomy, oh, forgive me, that didn't go there. we go. On the other hand, one cannot agree with the affirmation that the field of research itself is not subject to any limitations. The boundary is precisely the fundamental distinction between good and evil. This distinction place, takes place in the person's conscience. In conscience, we recognize, and this is from Vatican II, Buddy Metzbez, that says, deep within the conscience, men and women discover a law which they have not laid upon themselves, but which they must obey. Its voice, ever calling them to love and to do what is good and to avoid what is evil, tells them inwardly at the right moment, do this and shun that. For people have in their hearts a law inscribed by God, their dignity lies in observing this law, and by it, they will be judged. The ability to reason or discern well the moral decisions we face in our everyday living involves our conscience. We recognize that it offers practical wisdom, and this wisdom has to be well informed. One of the issues we just have talked about was the fact that we don't have enough information, there's not enough education about natural family planning or other alternatives that support church teaching. The process of determining right from wrong, it's not some magic voice in our heads. It can be readily discernible and it's available through accessing not only church documents, but automatically groups like this. There are all types of resources to help people have informed consciences in making these types of utility decisions. Imani Viti number 12 says, this doctrine often set forth by the teaching authority is founded upon the inseparable connection willed by God and which man cannot break on his own initiative between the two meanings of the conjugal act and that again is the unitive and the procreative. It says, for by its innate structure, and notice that it's the structure, it's how we are designed. The conjugal act, while most closely uniting the spouses, enables them to procreate new lives according to laws inscribed in the very being of man and woman. It is by safeguarding these two essential <coughs> aspects, union and procreation, that the conjugal act preserves in its fullness the sense of true mutual love and its ordination towards man's most highest calling to parenthood. When do we ever see that mentioned today, that the highest calling we have is to parenthood? In Donum Vitae, Evangelium Vitae, and Dignitatis Personae, these are many of the encyclicals that will help you in your conscience formation. And basically, this is a summary of them. It says, from the moment of fertilization, the new life is a human being with unconditional respect and moral rights. Because the embryo must be treated as a person, it needs to be cared for as any other human being. Teachings allow for fertility medication to encourage ovulation as a source of any higher order of multiple births. We recognize that's one of the consequences. Surgery to correct conditions like varicosis and endometriosis. We see for its procedures that substitute medical techniques for human intercourse. And this I'd like to actually share with you, this quote of Dr. Vitae. It says, certainly techniques aimed at removing obstacles to natural fertilization, as for example, hormonal treatments for infertility, 
surgery for endometriosis, unblocking the fallopian tubes or the surgical repair are illicit. All these techniques may be considered authentic treatments because once the problem causing the infertility has been resolved, the married couple is able to engage in conjugal acts resulting in procreation without the physician's action directly interfering in that act itself. None of these treatments replaces the conjugal act, which alone is worthy of truly responsible procreation. Truly responsible procreation. No biologist or doctor can reasonably claim, by virtue of scientific competence, to be able to decide on people's origin and destiny. This norm must be applied in a particular way in the field of sexuality and procreation, in which men and women actualize the fundamental values of love and life. So what are our best options for Catholic teaching? Pope Paul the Sixth Institute, as was mentioned before, and we see that there are many other resources right there at Marquette, and with um, Dr. Mickelson and Dr. Lawler and uh, his colleague, Dr. Caruso. Uh, we recognize that this is, of course, founded by Thomas Filters. Trans physicians, we recognize this, and it's based on church teachings. Adoption, do we ever think about that as a call of our vocation? Infertility is not a problem to be overcome, as Lisa Sol Cagle talks about another world theologian, but basically it's an opportunity. Embryonic stem cell research opposition is clearly prohibited, of course, in these documents. It often relies on, quote, leftover, unquote, embryos from IVF. Hormonal treatment of certain drugs has side effects, of course, as we've seen, and here's a reference for that. The use of perforated condoms to prevent hypospadias is, is uh, available and actually deemed licit by certain world theologians. We recognize that LTOT, or low tubal oil transfer, is also licit. Moving sperm deposited in the, in the vagina, uterus, or fallopian tube. The temporary removal of sperm or over to wash or capacitate for relocation of the fallopian tube is also morally illicit by many moral theologians. <coughs> Accumulating sperm from a series of marital acts and introducing them into the wife's vagina. Oftentimes we see that actually the condom is perforated. So in the conjugal act then, sperm is able to escape from the perforated condom. So there is a more natural sequence allowed. Meaning that the conjugal act is not just symbolism, it is actually occurring in, in bodily sperm entering into the fallopian tube. Sperm is conserved, concentrated, and placed in a wife's generative tract in association with the marital act. There's also SIP, which is sperm into fallopian tube transfer, and GIFT, gamete into fallopian tube transfer. Some Catholic world theologians, <coughs> like these gentlemen, defend GIFT, and others, like the following, are against it. So you see there's some division. Why would there be division? because those who actually oppose it think that it doesn't actually focus so clearly that there could be error in the interpretation, and that's why they oppose it. So in other words, they say that there has to be a lot more information, conscious formation, and good careful addressing the entire person and the issue, that it can't be just readily or grammatically assigned or decided upon. TOTS, tubal ovum transfer, is also one of the options. We see here the eventual success rates, and we've talked about those recently, and up to 86% of women under 35. We recognize that even with, the, at, with Thomas Hilgers, that his success rate really in the NAPRO technology is about 83%, so rather high, you know, comparatively. We also recognize that reproductive cycles can be prohibitively costly. Even one cycle is $12,400 on average. And it ranges from site to site. It could be automatically from $10,000 in some sites to maybe uh, about $20,000 in others. So health and, and protection of the, of the couple and their safety is really highlighted here. People who seek fertility treatment are often very, very vulnerable. The goal is to protect their health and their safety physically and mentally and spiritually. Ensuring reproductive techniques are safe and affordable able to make informed decisions. A couple must be given the options and well informed. Science empowered by love is the question. Morality, as we briefly discussed, is our challenge about what is most deeply human and choices which are either life enhancing or life diminishing. Dignitas personae offers reasoned argument in support of the culture of modern science as, quote, an invaluable science for the integral good of life and dignity of every human being. And my question to you this morning is, how can it be? We are here to make it so. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Davis and Thais. Um, we're into our break time, so perhaps in the spirit of that, uh, uh, we can maybe take uh, two or three minutes of questions. And the microphones are here for uh, wonderful presenters. My question is actually for you. Did I see up there that you said male, men are 100% free? Yes. Men are. Men are fertile all the time. So this, this sperm is always there. Not all men are fertile, but men are fertile all the time. Okay. I'm not a doctor. I just want to clarify that. Um, I'm my former re reading specialist. I was at a in service in 1994 in Lake Forest, and a doctor came in and told us I forgot what the in service was on. She told us that um, when when men um, smoke marijuana, that there's a chromosomal change in their um, sperm, which may um, decrease their fertility. Did you do you know anything about that? I haven't seen any studies about the association of male fertility and marijuana use, but I must say that too many of my patients trying to get pregnant have husbands smoking marijuana. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm I, sure we could do uh, I realize a that, literature but search or we could see it, if there's But most gonna... of your patients, as you said, in Milwaukee um, are not married or cohabitating. I would say most of my patients are typical American women who may be cohabitating, may be married, have lots of teenage patients. I take care of everybody, but I also have a group of people who seek me out because I'm supportive of natural family planning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this question might actually get you more um, clients that are smoking marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> I was fascinated by um, your point that, that Whole Foods sells these fertility um, necklaces. Yeah. And it's uh, it's occurred to my wife and I that that there is this whole market that the that the NFP movement isn't addressing, and that is the the sort of environmentally conscious sort of back to the earth kind of uh, crowd. You know, that every every year here in Chicago, there's this you know green eco fair, and we always wonder like why isn't there why why aren't we like you know, approaching that market and kind of rebranding uh, natural family planning. I wanted to know whether whether you knew of anybody who was trying to kind of reach the people who are who are not necessarily Catholic or not necessarily have a faith perspective, but just want to be more natural, want to be more sort of in, in uh, harmony with natural rhythm. It seems to me like there's a lot of women out there that are realizing that that they want to live a more natural lifestyle. And are we? And, and did you know of anyone who, or any kind of initiatives where we're trying to reach out to that population of those people? I think we're just trying to reach out to everyone. Um, the Marquette model, the Great model, is available to everyone no matter their faith. And a lot of those patients find us. Um, a lot of my patients who don't want to take any hormonal um, contraception, they may be using withdrawal or they may be using, be using condoms. And I always say there's some, we have something better. We have natural family planning that works just as well. There's a, a book called Taking Charge of Your Fertility, um, written by an uh, author, Wexler, who um, advocates using condoms in the fertile phase, so not on board with our ethics and morals. But that's, um, they have fertility charting online, so a lot of people find their way to those sorts of resources. Thank you, Dr. Mickelson, Dr. Davis, Matthias. They'll remain during our break uh, for uh, questions if you might uh, have uh, some more. So, well,